So we are up to our final phyla, uh, and within that phyla, we're just now focusing on the subphyla, uh, vertebrata. Right. So we already a uh, little bit when we talked about uh, chordates and chordate characteristics and the general breakdown. We had the subphyla, the urochordata, the tunicates or sea squirts, the cephalochordata, which were the amphioxus group, and then the vertebrata. This is a little bit larger um, cladogram that I usually have. And it's to kind of give you just a big picture summary. Uh, and I'll kind of go through that with some of the key characteristics and traits as we walk along the group. After this, I'm going to have a series of uh, focused lectures on maybe not every single group, but, but most of these groups. And we're going to talk about the, the key characteristics that may have evolved in that particular group, how those characteristics carry over potentially to other uh, groups uh, and things that kind of separate them you know, from one another or very, very unique characteristics that maybe only one group uh, particularly has. So that's going to kind of be the what we're currently doing and the future focus of the next series uh, of lectures I'm giving. So we're starting off with vertebrata. So they all have to have the chordate characteristics because they're chordata. And they all also have to have uh, a cranium. So remember vertebrata. Now pretty much all these groups have vertebra, vertebra, they all have vertebra. And then we get up to here and we have uh, some members here that don't have vertebra, uh, but they all have a cranium. All right, so cranium and vertebrae. And together, we're going to have a term here. We're going to call these the axial skeleton. Now there's also going to be something we'll refer to called the appendicular skeleton. All right, so the axial skeleton is kind of cranium and then vertebrae you know, attached to the cranium. Typically there are going to be then uh, holes in the cranium or the skull, you know, for eyes. And then there'll be other holes in the skull, and that's going to be the way some of these groups are, are divided but by the number of holes that they have in the skull, which have to do um, with sometimes muscle attachment for the jaw uh, and other characteristics. Taking a step back from that, we're going to have some groups that don't even have a, have a jaw. So the evolution of a jaw itself is going to be really important in kind of separating some of the groups and the progression of these organisms. One of the other trends that we're going to see as we move along is the movement uh, from aquatic organisms, fully aquatic, uh, getting respiring, you know, getting oxygen from the water with gill structures, having swimming appendages when they start to have appendages. Uh, and then we'll start to have the ability to get oxygen from air. Uh, some of them will have the ability to get oxygen through the air from their skin. Uh, some amphibians can do that. Um, and then the development of lungs. And so we'll start to have a whole couple different groups that have the ability to do that. And then we have organisms that can breathe on land, but they're still going to be tied to water um, for reproduction. And then we're going to end up kind of taking the organisms completely away from water uh, as we get into the, uh, the amniote group. Um, and, that we'll kind of, and that's something we're going to go into in a lot more detail, actually. So some of these things we'll spend uh, more time on, like what is an amniotic egg? What are the the sort of the structures within the egg and so on. So we'll kind of just go through the tour right now and I'll point out some of the key features, some of the names of the group so you're familiar with them uh, because some of these are more complex names that will come up later in other lectures and that way when they do come up you'll, you'll have some familiarity with them. So some ancestor, a chordate ancestor, uh, shared potentially with some of the other subphyla gave rise to this branch, okay, and so this, this, this whole clade of organisms. So we have the agnaths, and these are going to be jawless. So these are the jawless fish, um, and we'll go talk a little bit about them uh, as we talk about the, the evolution of the jaw. So we'll kind of start with them, and then we'll talk about the jaw structures and some of the bones uh, associated with the, the cranium that um, that, that go into the jaw. And then we'll have some of the jawed fish, um, which will be broken into really a couple different groups. So we're going to have cartilaginous fish. And when we talk about them, 
we're going to go into some of the details of bone development and you know what is actual bone uh, different types of bone and the way that bone is formed so there are a couple different ways that bone is actually formed one of the ways is to produce uh, cartilage first and then the cartilage is replaced with a bone that's one way of doing it and so it's potential that the cartilaginous fish are kind of a group that you know sort of lays down this original cartilaginous skeleton but then it's just never replaced with the true bone. And then they have certain advantages um, for that based on uh, weight and flexibility and a, a number of other things. And then you have the uh, ray finned fish, right, which then have true bone. So these sometimes called the bony fish. Um, and then as we go through these groups, we'll start to introduce uh, comparing the appendages that they have, part of the appendicular skeleton, um, with the development of actual limbs. So sort of a, a shoulder girdle and a pelvic girdle. So these are sort of extensions from the axial skeleton. So we'll then have you know, sort of a, a shoulder girdle and a pelvic girdle. And then with the shoulder girdle, we'll then have uh, bones that can be attached here, bones that can be attached here, uh, and start to put together, you know, this is our appendicular skeleton, so shoulders, pelvis, and then the sort of arms and legs, and then we'll get into sort of hands and feet and the digits and how they compare between some of the different groups. Um, where do they found, like in birds, they have some of the same bones that you do, but how are they redistributed? Um, some of the organisms, again, have like an amphibian, like a frog, has some of the same bones that you do in your appendages but some of them are fused together. So instead of say two bones in the forearm, there's a single bone, that sort of thing. Uh, we'll we'll kind of go through step by step as we bring in these groups. So that's mostly what we're gonna be um, focusing on, not necessarily all the details of the biology of each of the groups. We're gonna be just talking about vertebrates and the evolution of vertebrate characteristics and a number of key vertebrate characteristics that essentially bring the vertebrates um, to land and becoming um, terrestrial organisms as we end up with the, the mammals. Uh, and then we'll, and, and we'll compare characteristics and traits like those um, between the different groups. So the lobe fin fish then have appendages that can say crawl up onto land. Some of them uh, then develop lung-like structures so they can gulp air uh, into structures we'll talk about there. Some have a swim bladder uh, uh, and they can actually take um, gas from their blood and push it into the swim bladder so it can regulate their buoyancy. And a number of fish have that. So a number of the ray finned fish, for example, have this type of structure. Some other fish uh, can put air into this bladder in a different way. They can gulp the air. And so sometimes we see this where there are uh, fish that live in deep, deep water. They're not going to be coming up to surfaces to gulp air. Um, so they're extracting gases from their blood whereas other fish that might be in shallower water are possibly gulp air from the surface to help fill this bladder. The lungfish develop then structures as they're, say, gulping air um, that can actually then extract oxygen you know, from that air as well. So they have gills, but then they have the beginnings of lung-like structures, and then some of them ultimately have the beginnings of our true lung the development. Uh, and this is likely that they lived in shallow water, um, in peri dry periods where they would be stranded, many individuals will die. But some individuals who have a mutation that uh, allow them to have a more developed lung structure can then essentially breathe. They can extract oxygen from the air, which selects for them. And then they have their little um, lobed fins to move. So they can kind of crawl along and kind of find water, deeper water, cooler water, uh, and, and survive. And then pass those traits on. And then we start to get the development of the amphibians, which is what we'll get into. So the amphibians then are noted by the development uh, of being tetrapods. So they're going to have four really well-developed limbs in the appendicular skeleton. So these, these guys here, like the lungfish, will have the beginnings of them. The ray fin fish have a, kind of like the buds, the beginning, very, very, very beginning of some of these structures, but not really all the bones. The lungfish are going to have essentially the rudimentary bone structures that even we have uh, in our uh, limbs and shared with all the rest of the um, vertebrates here, the reptiles and birds and mammals. Uh, and they'll have those things as we, and then they'll get modified over time. But the amphibians develop them really well. This group called Sicilians, you probably have never heard of before. They are um, legless 
amphibians, so they're, they look snake-like, for example. Um, but And the same thing with snakes. We talk about them, snakes and lizards. Uh, ancestrally, these organisms uh, had appendages, and it's likely they, they lost them. And we can even find some snakes that have the beginnings of a pelvic and shoulder girdle, uh, and even really super tiny, tiny little limbs. Um, even though the, the outer body wall doesn't have any limbs protruding, uh, it just is kind of like the cranium and the, the vertebrae as a skeleton. But you can see that ancestrally there's some holdover of those. And that's the same thing here for these Sicilians, which are these amphibians that do that. Now, the amphibian group is also going to be tied to the water because amphibians lay their eggs in the water, they reproduce in the water, and their young have gills and have to extract oxygen from the water. Upon metamorphosis, the majority of them will then develop lungs and then move up onto land. Now, they're still going to be tied to water because one, their skin is going to dry out, and two, they have to reproduce and they have to be in the water to reproduce. Now, this is like some of the plants. If we think back to plant evolution, plant evolution was often tied to water as well. The, the plants had to reproduce by putting their gametes into the water. They had plants have swimming sperm that swim in the water that fertilize it. So our, our mosses and our ferns have this. So they're still today associated with very wet environments. Um, and, and then eventually we get the seed and then we can break that cycle and those organisms can survive and penetrate further onto land and not be tied directly to water. And that's what we see with the evolution of the egg. So amniotes... So we produce an amniotic egg. And so we start to see that you're familiar with the eggs that we see in reptiles. So turtles and lizards and snakes and crocodiles produce eggs and birds. And so you'll see the birds here are lumped in with the uh, reptiles in this particular uh, cladogram because really they're, you know, they're more closely related to crocodiles than crocodiles are to lizards and snakes. So they, they really belong together, although we'll, we'll pull out some really unique, uh, I'll spend a little more time on birds maybe than some of the other groups because they have so many very unique and interesting characteristics um, that allow them to adapt to flight uh, and the modifications of their feathers and so on. Uh, but then we go into mammals. We still have a group called the monotremes, uh, like the platypus, for example, that lay eggs. Right? So all these, so between all these groups here, we have an egg. Now the egg, the amniotic egg, contains an amniotic fluid, and so the organism still develops in an aquatic environment. So we technically never get away from that. Same for us. I mean, we develop in uh, a placenta, so we get to the placental uh, animals, uh, and there's a placental f a fluid, an amniotic fluid that's inside the placenta, and we you know, essentially live in that fluid as we develop for almost nine months. So we still have that sort of aquatic beginning, but the idea here is that these organisms essentially, some people say they, you know, they, they take the pond with them. So instead of requiring water to reproduce and water for the young to develop and actually just living completely their lives in the water, these organisms then go further into land, but the young still require an aquatic environment uh, to develop. And so that's happening inside now an egg-like structure. And that allows then the, this group to get further and further onto land and become more terrestrial animals. Uh, although many of them still have associations with water, uh, but like uh, think whales, you know, for example, they're mammals, uh, they're placental, you know, mammals, you know, as well. Um, but they likely evolved from more wolf-like animals that were terrestrial that kind of went back into the ocean. So they kind of came out and then and then went back in the other other way. Uh, so hagfish and lamprey belong to the jawless fish then we'll have the evolution of a jaw so that's going to be like the next lecture the first thing we're going to get into is the, the jawless fish and the evolution of a jaw that's the first thing uh, then we'll talk about bones and bone structure so the development of bone from in different ways and that's kind of how we'll address a little bit of the structures in the bony fish and then the appendages uh, that we start to see in the lungfish then we'll go into tetrapods, the development of actual limbs, and we'll look at the skeletal system a little more, some of the bones uh, and the development of those bones. As we go into the reptiles and birds, uh, the things we're going to focus on here, one is the amniotic egg. That'll be a, a separate uh, lecture, kind of breaking that down, going into the uh, parts of the amniotic egg, uh, because the, all these groups are going to have that. Uh, and then we'll talk a little bit about some of the groups, like the unique characteristics of some of them. Uh, there is a lecture way earlier on in the course where I look at you know how we break down a cladogram and I use this as the example uh, and, and it's actually based on skeletal structures so sort of openings in the skull in addition to the orbits 
So whereas the turtles, for example, don't have any, they kind of have the orbits. And then some of the other groups have one opening or two openings, you know, in the skull. Uh, and then that's sort of the things that sort of set, set them apart on each side. I'm, I'm kind of talking about in addition to the orbits. So these openings, kind of the skull structures kind of have a, a impact here. Other bone structures, appendicular skeletal structures, um, and teeth and the way the teeth develop uh, actually unite the crocodilians and the birds. Um, they think birds don't have teeth, but ancestrally um, they did, and their teeth were much more like the crocodilian teeth than uh, any of the other groups. Um, and then the mammals are going to have their own unique teeth. Uh, uh, so we'll talk about those um, in particular. Uh, talk about hair, you know, development, some of the glands and other structures that develop in mammals. So we're kind of covering a lot of, you know, animal anatomy, the, the, just like we had in all the other groups. We're looking at organs and organ systems and tissues and development of tissues and so on. But, at, but we're doing that as we go through the different groups of organisms um, and talk a little bit about the groups themselves. So this is just kind of like the introduction to um, the vertebrates, the big picture of everything we're going to cover um, from now as we're going to start with jaws next to where we end with uh, the mammals.